Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. In the book, the trilogy, The Wing Feather Saga, written by Andrew Peterson, there are three uh, siblings who are gifted with a mystical, divine vocation. And the only way that they can actualize what God has called them to do is for these three siblings to gather physically in this special space, like a temple. And when they do this, when they gather in the right spot all together, then, only then, does God reveal himself in a special way and give them a unique ability more tools, more giftings, in order to accomplish the redemptive work of the world to which they were called. It only happened whenever they gathered in this temple. I'm not going to go into the story. You guys should read it. It's a, it's a wonderful book. You should read it to your kids. I, I mention it for two reasons. One, it has very much to do with our subject for this morning, and that is unity. Unity. But also because there are so many gifted writers sitting in this room right now. And I just want to throw it out to you that I would love a dozen stories to be written in the next decade at this parish that have this theme that God is up to things and has in his mind things and callings upon each and every one of us that can only be realized when we come together and find reasons for unity. There's a thousand stories about disunity. Not very many stories about unity. So just a pitch. Bo, you're here. Write me a story that I can read to my kids so that maybe, possibly, we might learn to be human. This subject of unity is very important, especially this week. We just elected a new archbishop. Tensions are high, especially in the dumpster fire of online discourse, which is why you should avoid it at all costs. But if we're being honest, we need to talk about unity not just this week, but because of the era and region of the world that we live in. We as modern Western Americans living in the South are the most splitting people in the history of the world. I would, I would double down on that claim. We're the most splitting people in the history of the world. Now there's a lot of reasons for this. Modern affluence, for one, has robbed us of the natural reminders that we actually do need each other in order to survive. Much less to be what God called us to be. I so long to explain and to come to an understanding as a community of why it is that almost everything that could be said of a thing, where there are certain things that we say, what God has made, let no man put a son in it. Right? What God has made, let no man put asunder. Let no man split in two. The body, our, our, our gender from our identity. What God has made, let no man put asunder. Marriage. What God has made, let no man put asunder. And the church. What God has made, let no man split in two. These are the things that as modern Christians... We are so ready to split. The culture we live in is so ready to split. And I would like to teach you about the philosophical underpinnings of why it is that we as post-enlightenment Christians are so ready to put asunder what God has made. And I'm not going to do that today. I will, however, put it in the records room this week. I already have it written. I cut it from this sermon so that I can talk about other things. I'm going to teach you about the philosophy of nominalism. Nominalism. And I'm going to explain in the rector's note this week why it is that we are so geared towards splitting apart everything that God has in his mind. The sacraments, 
the church as modern people. But today, we're going to stick to the text. And the text is 1 Samuel 11. And we're going to attack the text in the same way that we do here every week, in the fourfold sense. So, are you ready to jump into the literal sense? Yes. There you go. We're learning that we're in the Southeast Diocese. So I love that. We're going to get there. We respond. All right, here we go. Literal meaning. So, last week we saw that Saul was anointed by Samuel on an unchosen path. Can we just say how wonderful of a sermon that was last week? It was great. Really, really good. Um, he was seen seeking his father's donkeys, the axes of Kish. We glean from that text, we can glean from our text this morning, that after this anointing, Saul went back to his father's house. We have to keep in mind that there was no pre-established monarchy at the time. There was no palace. They hadn't had a throne or a, a crown crafted yet. There was nothing. He was anointed the king of Israel, but at the time, at best, Israel was a mere confederation of 12 separate tribes. It would have been very much like that Monty Python sketch uh, from the search for the Holy Grail. Who are you? I am Arthur, king of the Britons. King of the who? The Britons. Who are the Britons? We are. We all are. And I am your king. I didn't know we had a king. I thought we were an autonomous collective. And so on and so forth. That's, that's actually written on an actual script from ancient Israel. I'm just joking. <laughs> they found it in the cuneiform. But that is how the tribes in Israel thought of themselves. Very separate, very distinct. They were at best loosely connected tribes. Now when there was a threat or an enemy like the Philistines, then a charismatic leader like Samson would rise up and they would have an ad hoc temporary confederation and take care of business. But when things were turning into peace, then it would devolve into the hideous effects of tribalism. Say tribalism. If the subject of our sermon today is unity, then our punching bag will be tribalism. This is where our text picks up. 1 Samuel 11. It's somewhere in your book. You can find it if you'd like. We learn there that a local Canaanite warlord named Nahash the Ammonite came against one of the local groups of one of the tribes in Israel, the people that lived in Jabesh Gilead. And verse 1, notice that the people in Jabesh Gilead immediately sought to form a covenant with the Ammonites. Immediately. Verse 1 of the story. He came against them. They were like, hey, want to like, make a covenant? They did not at first seek the support of their brothers and sisters in the Lord, the other Hebrews. That's how deeply divided tribalism had made the people of God. In fact, in just a few verses, after they had come together, after the Lord had delivered the Ammonites in their hand, the first thing that they did was like, hey, we had a disagreement like a few months back about whether Saul should be king. Maybe we should kill the people that we disagree with, even though they're like fellow Israelites. That's how bad the people of God had got due to, what's our punching bag? They only thought to act like one people in one mind, like our epistle talks about. After the Ammonites said, sure, we'll make a covenant with you. But we're going to pluck out all of your right eyes, and then you're going to be our slaves. And then they said, hmm, can we have a moment? And they fled and they told Saul. So you guys with me on the context here? The text says that when Saul heard of the threat, 
The Spirit of the God came upon him, and his heart was kindled in anger greatly. And then he proceeds to do something really strange. And this action that he takes is actually going to serve as the primary central type of this homily. So pay attention. He takes an ox and he cuts it into pieces. And then he sends the pieces, the bloody chunks of ox flesh to all of the tribal groups in Israel. Kind of gross, right? Now I want us to imagine what it would have been like to receive a chunk of this meat. Because in just a few minutes, I'm going to relate this to the receiving of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. What did receiving a piece of ox carcass mean to tribal Israel? Well, it meant at least three things. Let's work through it. First, it was a symbol of their essential unity. Their essential unity. This idea is embedded in the action that they must take these separated pieces and bring them back together. I've got the ear. Hey, who's got the foot? I've got the rump. I'm the rump guy. Right? They all got these pieces of this ox that they need to bring back together. To understand this, you might imagine a father who has four um, uh, sorry, estranged, estranged children, right? He has four estranged children, and he wants to bring them back together. So what does he do? He writes a message to them on a piece of paper. And then he rips it into four pieces, and he sends each a piece of the note. How do they know what the Father has for them? How do they read the will? They must come together and put the pages back together. So it is with the cutting up of an ox and sending out the pieces. It was a symbol of their essential unity. Second, it was a call to action. Perhaps this meaning is embedded in the first. They were to come together and reject tribalism in order to approach an attack upon an enemy. In this case, the Ammonites. Third, it was a threat. It was a threat against disunity. In fact, this meaning is the only thing that Saul makes explicit in the action. He says, if y'all bickering tribes don't come here right now, I am going to do to your house what I just did to this ox. It's a threat. Let's remember that. It's a threat. So, just to review, the, the dispersing of the pieces of a bloody carcass, a body, meant the essential unity of God's people, a call to action, and a threat against tribalism and disunity. And the people received the message. A spirit of fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came together as one, and they conquered the enemies. Now to switch to the typological, I'm sure that you can see that this passage has deep typological meaning. The people of Israel are the church. And just like them, we are perpetually given towards tribalism. We're tempted by separatism. We naturally, spiritual entropy means that eventually we find ourselves at odds with those who are actually brothers and sisters in Christ. Nahash the enemy, who's that? Satan, right? That's the typological fulfillment. Nahash the enemy, the Ammonite, is our arch enemy, Satan. And like Nahash, Satan attacks the tribes that isolate themselves into tiny groups. To combat this tribalistic tendency in his church, Jesus, the new... Who's Jesus? The new Saul. 
Saul. Jesus, the new Saul, rises up and he sends out his own flesh and blood to the multiple groups in the church. You with me so far? Each group receives their piece of the whole, his fleshly sacrificial body. And it has the same three meanings that it did for Israel. First, it testifies to our essential oneness and unity as the church. As we all receive a piece of his broken body, we must reassemble that body through coming together with the bonds of charity. In other words, just as the ox was not meant to stay chunked up and separate, so too the broken, dispersed body of Jesus is not meant to stay broken and dispersed. It is to be reunited physically and spiritually through the unity of the one church, who is his singular body. The second meaning is also present a call to a common enemy and a common action. Tribalism makes enemies of our friends and our brothers, doesn't it? But our common enemy is no mystery. Our common enemy is Satan, not the lives, not other nations. It's the flesh, which lives inside us, Satan, and the cosmic system of the world that turns men's hearts towards darkness. But the third meaning is also present. A threat against disunity. If the Israelites did not leave aside the tribalism and come together in unity, then Saul threatened to do to them what he had done to the oxen. So it is with Jesus. Like Saul, his wrath is kindled greatly at the schismatics and the tribalists in the church. You might think that this is crazy. Perhaps you've never heard of this before. But take a look closer at 1 Corinthians 11. I'll remind you. You don't need to turn. For those that partake of the body, the fleshly body of Christ, Unworthily, it says. Those people are those who do not discern the Lord's body. That's what it says. They did not understand what receiving the flesh of Christ meant for them. Meaning they did not live out the essential unity of the church. Instead, they resided in tribes. And we see this clearly in the context of 1 Corinthians 11. The tribes were clear. There were the tribes of the rich. There were the tribes of the poor. There were the tribes of those who followed Peter. The tribe of those who followed Paul and Apollos. The tribe of those who followed Jesus. These men and women who love to divide but hate to unite. Who carry hatchets in their hearts but not sutures. These people eat and drink damnation on themselves. Those who split apart the singular body of Christ will be split limb from limb when Jesus comes back. Amen. Just joking. I'm not going to leave it there. (laughs) Now visitors, let me tell you, we don't often Uh, threaten divine dismemberment to everyone uh, weekly. Obviously, we need to go deeper into the question of unity. It's not not so simple as to say, choose unity or Jesus is going to cut you. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm also not saying what I said. I do hope that This typological meaning, which is clear in the text, scares schismatics and pathological separatists into Christian charity. Protestantism would not be passing 40,000 denominations 
without an enormous amount of tribalist separatists. But for most of us, we need to hear more nuance if this typological meaning is to have value and help. So let us do that with the moral sense, shall we? Let's start with what should always be true. The church must receive the body of Jesus with a serious devotion to the unity of God's people. A serious devotion. I hope that this homily adds questions to how y'all prepare for Holy Communion. Do I have charity towards my brothers and sisters in other tribes of God's church? Do I have charity towards the Pentecostals? Towards the Roman Catholics? Towards the Southern Baptists? Towards the Eastern Orthodox? Towards churches for the sake of others? Towards the Anglo Catholics? Towards our new Archbishop? Do I give thanks for them in my heart? Do I long for when we are one? Do I think that we are one? Is our oneness more real to me than our divisions? My guess is that most of us think about partaking of the body worthily, only in terms of our individual sin, and not our communal fidelity. I bet my big toe since we're talking about dismemberment. That most of us, when we think about what it means that the, the Lord would condemn us when we take the body and blood of Christ unworthily, we're probably thinking about the punishment for our individual misdeeds and not his Saul-like anger getting kindled at the tribalism of his own people. Have you ever thought about that? If we gained this serious devotion to the unity of the church, we would live differently. We would have more friendships with those outside of our tribe. How many friends do you have who are Roman Catholic or Orthodox? What about a Pentecostal? They're really fun friends to have, by the way. We would fight much less with other Christians in person and especially online. Let's put that away forever. We would be much slower to want to split and separate our tribe into smaller and smaller tribes. Now let me be clear. There are times when division, even schism, is necessary in the church. I'm going to talk about that here in a moment. But if we truly discern the meaning of the broken body, then we would not divide it further into other pieces. We would be much more ready to put it back together. And we would have more sorrow when it had to break. But what a needful schism over real heresy. You know, there is such a thing as orthodoxy. And there is such a thing as heresy. Telling the truth with true devotion to the health of the whole body, that is neat and right so to do. We should never lose that. It's called the ministry of exhortation. If heretics are not driven away, there is punishment for that. But there is also punishment for those who pull out the weeds in an effort to expel the tares. The one holy Catholic and apostolic church must simultaneously banish false doctrine and hold together the unity of the one holy Catholic church. There is punishment if we accept heresy on the one side and punishment if we separate needlessly on the other. What are we gonna do? Truth, unity, unity, truth. Do you guys ever feel the tension? I feel it all the time. What are we gonna do? 
How do we decide these things? It's crucial here to see that it is the bishop who is tasked with this impossible task. Not us. Not you. Not me. My job is at that altar. I pivot for you. Your job is to come to this altar, to let the Christ that we imbibe radiate out of us for this little community. You are not a bishop. I am not a bishop. They are the bishops. That's why we pray for them. They carry a crozier in order to banish wolves and gently loop back in those who are confused. To split and unite. So if you want to know how this charge to unity maps on to the very complicated world of theological sickness and cultural disease, follow the bishop. The tribes of Israel were to gather around who? The Lord's anointing. If y'all don't gather around me, Saul, and Samuel, then what? We gather around the Lord's anointing, obedience, and humility to what God is doing is what kept every man from doing what was right in his own eyes. So it is for us. Follow the bishop. The Lord will not abandon his church. To close, I'll briefly touch on the anagogy, where we turn our minds towards eternity. Isn't this nice? We can turn our minds towards eternity where it's not going to be broken anymore. I want you guys to think ahead, just to close, of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Won't that be amazing? Won't it be amazing whenever there's no acronyms to remember in our heads? I cannot wait to blissfully forget every darned acronym. I hate acronyms. There will be no acronyms at the marriage supper. What a joyous moment it will be. But how will the heavenly banquet be for those who have trained their heart for decades to hate their brothers and sisters of other tribes who will be at that table? Come, beloved. Let us prepare for that great day when the one holy Catholic and apostolic church will be truly one. During this time, we set the table for Holy Communion. Also, our ushers will come forward to receive an offering. Those of you that are new here,